Thank you, Jagan. Thank you, Mr. Mark Anthony White, Anjum Parvez, Ravi Gupta, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start where Mark White concluded by drawing inspiration from General Patton. Insofar as India is concerned, I have absolutely no doubt and the evidence is available for all to see that insofar as the urban space is concerned, the country has a vision and it has a strategy and that strategy finds expression and vigorous implementation through the five or six flagship programs of the government. Without being critical, I think the pre-May 2014 India did not sufficiently acknowledge either the scale or the pace of urbanization that was taking place in India. There are good reasons for that. We are still, in terms of the demographic distribution of our population, more heavily concentrated in what could be called the rural areas. But the pace of urbanization that is taking place, robust and autonomous, is such that we have already erred and erred, I think, seriously in ignoring the urban space in many of the decades following our independence. Because we thought that we were an agricultural country, our mental space was more prominently occupied by the, what is called rural development. The debate is not new to India. I think anyone who has been a student of the Indian national movement, the freedom struggle, knows that there was even some disagreement of opinion between the two stalwarts, the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, and the first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru. Gandhiji thought, perhaps for good reason, that India's salvation future actually lay in the village. Now, the decentralized village economy that the Mahatma had in his mind was part of a vision which many Indians shared. I still find uh, very important political leaders today, including some I greatly respect, talk in terms of salvation lying in the rural space being attended to and real progress being delivered there. I have no disagreement with that. In fact, I agree with that assessment, but let me try and qualify why I think that is important. The fact of the matter is that in the year of the Lord 2018, there are two trends which I regard as given. One is that the Indian cities are growing and that the growth of the economy is coming essentially from the urban space. 65% of our GDP today is accounted for by the cities. More than 90% of our tax receipts come from the cities and this is going to grow. We have no option but to deal with the challenges posed by urbanization. And these are challenges not of sheer numbers alone. These are challenges posed by poverty, which comes as a consequence of that economic growth. People migrate from rural areas to urban areas in search for jobs. And they do so for good economic reasons. The rural space where 66% of India's population still resides, 
accounts only if you look at the contribution of agriculture to the GDP only for about 12% of the GDP. Is it any surprise therefore that no matter how seriously you believe in the village being the center of a decentralized economy or how much you are in love with the rural environment, when it comes to sheer livelihood, you will move from that rural space into the city. Now that, I think, should be regarded as a given. And the growth of the economy, social mobility, poverty alleviation, these are all terms. But if you look at the scale at which we are moving, the global benchmark figure, and Jagan will have to correct me, just now for urban existence is about 50%, I think. Whereas in India, we are still at 30% plus. So at some stage, Jagan reminded me the West regarded India as a reluctant urbanizer. I think that was a wrong characterization. Because India's case, as with so many other things, our experience with social inclusion, our democracy, our colonial heritage, India is a sui generis case. And that sui generis case means that if you have a population of 1.25 billion now, it was 300 and 350 million in 1947, you cannot be compared to countries like Brazil or Mexico. I had the privilege of being India's ambassador to Brazil. It's a country I greatly admire. But you know, it has three times India's land area, one-sixth our population, and it has 23% of the world's freshwater reserves. Now, if I had those kind of, uh, uh, you know, statistical comfort zone to fall back on, no Chinese or Indian does that. Because our population, just now, 1.25 billion plus. But we have to prepare for the fact that by 2030, 40% of Indians will live in urban spaces. You're not going to be able to stop that. Because in a democracy, it is up to, and democracy is all about that. Any Indian can choose. Uh, if you find the air in Delhi tomorrow uh, suffocating, you can pick up your bag and baggage and go and live in Bangalore. But I don't think Bangalore is any better. So you can then go and look for comfort somewhere else. But the fact is you have the freedom to move. But as I saw in a newspaper report two days ago, Delhi has also now got the highest amount of income tax uh, returns. It has overtaken Mumbai. The point I'm making is that we should start our understanding of the situation, the process, by the acknowledgement of the fact that urbanization is here to stay and that the only difference we can make is either to be able to successfully plan for it or as in the previous pre-2014 period, we just lament the fact that unregulated urbanization has taken place. So what is it that we are doing? Let me come to the substance of today's um, situation. We have a very serious problem in our urban spaces, but the Modi government decided to embrace urbanization as a win-win, and we have decided to do something about it. If, you, if I were to just catalog what we have done in Delhi, it is impressive, I mean the system. Yesterday, the Prime Minister inaugurated the fourth um, peripheral Western Expressway. Yesterday, we inaugurated another section of the metro to take the Delhi metro to 317 kilometers. It's now amongst the top four or five metro systems in the world. It's a world-class asset. It has affordability, efficiency, all those attributes. And I can give you a list of things which we've done in order to solve the problem. But this is almost like running and running fast in the same place in just in order to be able to remain in the same place because the problems are of such a nature. But I have a feeling that 
The difference that the flagship programs are beginning to make, and I come to the subject of this summit meeting, Swachh Bharat and the Amrut missions in particular. Let me start with the Swachh Bharat mission. The sanitation cover was 39% in 2014, is that the figure for the rural or the uh, overall? Uh, overall, 39% in 2014. Today, that sanitation cover is 92%. This is all in the scope of four years. The Prime Minister announced from the ramparts of the Red Fort when he was speaking on 15th August 2014, that he would expect India as part of a fulfillment of our debt to the Mahatma, that we would be open defecation free by 2nd October 2019, when India celebrates the 150th birth anniversary of the Mahatma and also that we would have 100% solid waste management. Speaking on the occasion of a function which the Prime Minister organized yesterday, the Finance Minister said that when the Prime Minister announced this on 15th August 2014, there were many of us, not me, I wasn't here then, uh, who felt that it was perhaps too bold and or outrageous a target to set. But let me remind you, the Prime Minister had also said in 2014, when the World Bank ranked India at 142 amongst 190 or so countries in the ease of doing business, that he would like to see India at number 50, many people thought that was also bold and maybe a little reckless. But what we've proved, I think, in the four years of the Modi government, thanks to stakeholder participation, and that's where you guys come in, thanks to our citizens, that Swachhata or the Swachh Bharat mission has moved from being a project of the government to being a project of the people or a Janandolan. And I think the citizenship, citizen stakeholder participation becomes clear because there is a realization that poor sanitation, lack of clean drinking water, lack of hygiene in the household and the community creates an adverse impact on health as well as economic losses. So you have two aspects to this. You have the physical targets, the number of toilets you have to build. I was very happy to pick up the, today that the first mention of a public toilet in the history of us is in Jahangir's time. What year was it? 1515? 1556. Now, this is fascinating because if in 1556 there's a mention, I'm sure toilets were built before that. It's just a question of um, somebody not having chronicled it or recorded it. But today, my target of urban toilets is 67 lakhs or 6.7 million. That is to be completed by 2nd January, uh, 2nd October 2019. We have already done 6.2 million. And I have no doubt that by March of 2019, we would have finished all the toilet construction. These are individual household toilets. When it comes to community toilets, our target is 5 lakhs. We have already done more than 4 lakhs. Again, I am sure this can be done by that time. But apart from Swachhata, uh, but the another component of that is solid scientific, solid waste management. And I have no doubt that even though the figures don't show it, but we have come up from 19% to 43%. But if you look at all the technology and the investment which is in the pipeline, that jump from 43 upwards will come in one spurt. And I think we are on the verge of getting that. Uh, I come now to the Amrut scheme. First of all, I think it's a good starting point to acknowledge that we have something like 
4,400 cities in India. Our friend from Karnataka was mentioning about the coverage in terms of water supply connections and uh, uh, sewage treatment. Let me remind all of you that the Amrut scheme, which was conceived and initiated in June 2005, uh, 15, has to run for a period of five years till June 2020. Again, because of the peculiar funding uh, uh, method 2040-40, it covers 500 Indian cities with a population of over 1 lakh, over 100,000. And you know what my biggest challenge today is? To face up to my colleagues, and let me also remind you, Amrut covers already 66% of the urban cities. But there is such a clamor to get cities which either did not qualify on account of the population threshold, that's 100,000, 1 lakh, or which, you know, if you have 4,000 cities and you can choose only 500, somebody, some which even qualified according to the population criteria would have to be left out because you have to be selective. Demand is for an Amrut Plus. Now, I do not miss any public event to say, oh, that is an intent. But there's also a reality. If you are in the process of completing a scheme for water tap connections and waste management and solid uh, and sewer, sewer treatment for 500 cities, and you are still two years from the time of completion, you can't announce another scheme without completing the first one. So I keep talking about an Amrut Plus, even if it is symbolic with, let's say, plus 50, plus 10 percent, or plus 20 percent. But yes, it's very much on the cards. And I will use whatever margin of persuasion I have with the finance minister and the prime minister to have a statement of intent delivered on that uh, before we go into the next election, so that when we are back, we can implement it. Now, coming to smart cities, so look at the overall base, 4,400 cities, 500 are smart cities, uh, 500 are Amrut cities, and within that, 100 smart cities. Now, again, if you were cynical, you would ask, why not more smart cities? Well, if you had no issue on resources, I would also say why not. So I was a little intrigued when I think it was Mr. Ravi Gupta who said that we started our smart city program in 2010. Well, that is smart city in terms of a general expression. But the smart city program that I am speaking about, again, was conceived, announced, in June 2015, it is due to be completed by 2022. It has selected 100 smart cities, not by somebody exercising a choice sitting in Delhi, as used to happen in the previous government. You used to sit in Nirman Bhavan, decide what the scheme is, uh, who will get the contract. This is nothing. This is cooperative, competitive federalism. We de de devise a scheme, we announce it, and then cities have to bid. They come forward and project their requirements in terms of a proposal. That proposal is evaluated. Now, these schemes all require tons and tons of money. But before I go off the smart cities, uh, I have no doubt that in an ideal setting, you would be able to choose 100 new smart cities and give them um, you know, underground uh, sanitation, drainage, sewer, sewer treatment plant. But you know, if you live in a country like India with such a rich and cultural past, you can't have 100 new smart cities if you don't deal with the existing ones. So 90 of the smart city projects are brownfield. And I would request you to go and see the development. When I became a minister in September of 2017, early in September, there was a lot of cynicism. Where are the smart cities? So I used to say, well, you know, if you have a scheme like this where you have no experience, it takes time to get a project management consultant. It takes time to set up a special purpose vehicle. And the first tranche of 20 smart cities was only announced in January of 2016. And after that, you take these 15, 15 months. But the good news is that I think out of the 100, all, all of them have um, more or less 97, 98. 
project management consultants and SPVs. Some of them were only announced in February this year. I had said in September and October of 2017 that when the tenders which have been awarded result in being implemented, you will see the physical manifestations of the smart cities. And I'm very happy to inform you. And I said then between June and December 2018, today you see those projects. Therefore, that cynicism is missing. Well, I'd like to do it quickly, but I'm not in favor of releasing funds unless I see, you know, the whole project has been designed in such a way, you come up with a DPR, you tender those projects, as those projects uh, unfold, you keep getting the money. And there is an element of private-public partnership, etc. Coming back to sanitation, I have no doubt whatsoever, and this is that the Swatch the mission, the absolute insistence on water, sanitation and hygiene, this now permeates throughout the country in all levels, symbolized by the Mahatma's um, pair of spectacles. But I want to come to the issue of resources. I think one point which is invariably overlooked is that the change in direction seems to have been missed. After the latest finance commission, which is 14th, right? Yeah. We decided that we would be passing money on to the urban local bodies via the state government. Now, I know some state governments have been less than prompt in passing the money on, but there will always remain, because of the magnitude of the task to be performed, there will always remain a shortfall in resources. Now, a state which is difficult to characterize in the Indian state, I'm a very proud Indian, I was born here, I have represented India for 40 years outside, and you will not come across a more passionate advocate for what is India. But believe me, a state like India, which is characterized by lack of capacity in many respects, well, we used to have capacity before we were a modern state. Our contribution to the global GDP was 27% in 1700. I'm quoting a Cambridge economist, Angus Madison. After we had suffered the ravages of colonial, colonial rule for 190 years, our contribution to the global GDP had come down from 27% to 3%. After seven year, 70 years of independence, it's only 12%. We grew in the last three quarters at the rate of 7.2%, 7.7%, and 8.2%. At this rate, we will be a $5 trillion economy by the time we reach 2022 or 2025. When you're a $5 trillion economy and your per capita income doubles, because today it's very low, many of the problems we are speaking about today will just be reference points in the past. But you still have to deal with the population and the demands of the citizenry in terms of water and sanitation between now and 2025. And by the time we reach 2030, when the sustainable development goals are completed, we'll be a $10 trillion economy with the per capita income quadruple. But just today, it is both unfair and I think unrealistic to expect urban local bodies not to raise their revenues either directly or through innovative financing mechanisms and depend on the center for that. Because the center also has to raise revenue. And anybody who is even remotely familiar with the kind of challenges the center has will say that water and sanitation, hygiene, wash, very important. But there are other issues also. So you will have pulling, pulls and pressures in different directions. Well, I'm delighted to tell you that in the last year or so that I've been a minister, I've seen Pune raise funds through the floating of municipal bonds. I've seen Hyderabad, I've seen one more, and now Amravati also, I think, uh, 2,000 crores. So total we have four at 2,600 crores. I was told there's a fifth one also, but since there are elections there, I should not be speaking about it because, you know, the code of conduct, uh, it might just uh, attract some comment on that. I have also no doubt, going by the experience of the Delhi Metro, that the citizen 
average citizen of this country is happy to pay for urban services provided he or she is assured that those urban services are available, they're efficiently delivered, and they are priced in an affordable manner. What happens, unfortunately, is that the urban local bodies, like the rest of our system, tends to become a part of a larger system which is, for want of a better term, succumbing to populism. For good reason, we decided not to allow the metro system to be under any particular government directly. We may have created a special purpose vehicle out from an act of parliament, and uh, so uh, the fair fixation is done by a statutory body which is um, headed by a judge of the um, uh, high court or a retired judge, and they are in a position to take decisions insulated from you know, populism and populist pressures uh, available on each side. And it works. And believe me, it works. Similarly, I believe, in for urban local bodies, we will have to ensure, and those who are responsible for those urban local bodies will need to ensure that that innovative financing solutions are forthcoming and that will require capacity building. I'm very happy to know that um, Jagan and his colleagues and others who uh, are part of my ministry are now making a special effort to train capacity building amongst urban local bodies. I have also felt for a long time, you know, when I was very young and um, employment opportunities were not that many, uh, in a few years prior to my entering the labor market, everybody wanted to be an engineer because they thought India will grow and therefore there will be jobs of mechanical engineers, etc. By the time I reached university, that was beginning to change a little. But if I had to do counseling or provide advice to uh, you know, parents or other, with, with children coming into the market, I would say go in for professions which deal with the urban space. Because we are today, for a variety of reasons, I'll give you only one, we are on the cusp of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, we have a dual challenge. I mean, on the one hand, we are having to skill people at the level of masons, uh, um, carpenters, and, um, you know, um, other people who, who deal with the construction industry at a basic level. We are also having to look at now the fourth industrial revolution, which is all going to be about urban services, the use of technology. And we are woefully short of urban planners, of architects, uh, you know, people who will be able to run the municipalities and the urban local bodies. I have been suggesting for a long time, even at the risk of uh, drawing um, adverse comment from my former colleagues in the civil service, I think you need professional cadre of uh, managers to uh, manage the urban space. I was very happy the other day when I found um, one of my colleagues, I think the secretary was telling me that Patna today has a uh, 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 MBA, um, you know, a uh, postgraduate student in, uh, uh, with a qualification, MBA qualification as a city manager. I mean, that's what you need. I mean, I'm not uh, casting, a, making a comment one way or the other, but that's the shape of things to come. I do not believe, even, even in the foreign service when I was there, uh, yes, everybody came in through an exam, you qualified, but some, many of us uh, were able over a um, uh, extended period of time, develop interest, specialization, and we'll be able to make contribution. If you think that a generalist service can be running, uh, um, you know, central government ministries ranging from, uh, you know, petroleum to um, housing to home to defense and also manage urban local bodies, no, I think you need domain knowledge, you need subject specialization, so the urban local bodies are really crying out for attention. I've been a little harsh in my criticism sometimes when I described our um, town planners as living in the Bullock uh, uh, cart era, and I thought I'd be criticized, but I, I was surprised I wasn't. Now, I, I offer you one or two things um, by way of comments. If you look at the point of time when Mumbai and Shanghai were almost identical cities in terms of uh, FAR. You know what happened after that? Shanghai went uh, 
sky high, Mumbai remained almost there. Now the Chief Minister has raised the FAR, it's taken it from 1.3 to 3 for um, uh, residential areas and 5 for commercial areas. That will make a difference. I think in Delhi also we have no option in the end other than to raise the FAR, but we have to do it by being able to provide adequate safeguards in terms of water, parking, all other amenities. So we are in the process now of trying to work that out, produce more um, pedestrian space, more cycling tracks. In fact, one of my uh, pet projects these days is to have whole of Delhi um, linked by a, a series and web of uh, pedestrian uh, pathways. And we are already, we've looked at a design, we are doing it for a small section. All this is necessary. But at the heart of that is water, sanitation and hygiene. I just want to, before I conclude, give you some statistics which are part of my speaking notes. Under the Amrut scheme, over 2,400 projects worth 74,000 crores that are targeted towards improved water supply, sewage and drainage have been approved under the state annual action plans for the period 2015 to 20. We have also introduced the Amrut Technology Challenge, which witnessed the need for non-essential human entry for cleaning of sewers and septic tanks. Smart cities are also developing smart, sustainable and resilient sanitation systems through public-private partnership. And all this is independently being done, but it is also a part of our commitment to implement SDG 6, which deals with ensuring access and sanitation of for all by 2030 through collective efforts and innovative processes. I want to say a word or two about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, when I was ambassador to the UN uh, in New York, I had more or less made up my mind, and those were the final years of the Millennium Development Goals being implemented, that we would not repeat the experience of the MDGs. You know, the MDGs were conceived and designed in the think tank of the West, the OECD. But they came to us in the form of prescription. You do this, you do that, you do this. Now, even if you didn't like it, because it was all about alleviation of poverty and other basic uh, good things of life, nobody wanted to be against them. So we went along with the process. Well, the MDGs got uh, implemented. They succeeded, largely because a large developing country called China, uh, well, you may disagree whether it's a developing country, but a large country like China, was able to lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty with some help from countries like India and the other. But let me emphasize the Sustainable Development Goals, and I say this in the context of SDG 6. The Sustainable Development Goals will succeed because of India. And because India will succeed, the SDGs will succeed. Now, the SDGs were adopted in September of 2015 at the UN General Assembly. But Mr. Modi had already started conceiving them when he became Prime Minister in May 2014. Um, and in fact, many of the flagship programs which deal with the SDGs actually were announced in June 2015. So we are way ahead on that. And I think even on implementation, when the Secretary General was here, uh, we had an occasion to talk to him and said that, you know, many of the things that we are doing will result in the um, SDGs being fulfilled much before, completed much before 2030. Now, coming to the innovative uh, or innovation and the innovation hub, I have a friend who is a very famous author. Uh, he lives in New York most of the time. And he once told me that, look, uh, all this business about universities producing knowledge, and he's a professor also at a prestigious university. He said, that's not true. He said, I go to the university only for one reason, because I want to be in the company of intelligent people. Most other people come in to get an education, which does not produce knowledge. It, it recycles something in an industrial manner. He said, if you actually want innovation, or you want to witness creativity, or you want to witness something that is really entrepreneur, uh, un entrepreneurial, he said, go to the cafe uh, uh, on the sidewalks in Paris or go to some other place where you have young or intelligent people together like you get all of you gathered here 
and just discuss a subject. See how many new ideas come through. And therefore, I like uh, uh, Mark's um, thing about creative solutions because it's not about something which is purely cerebral. You're dealing with real life solutions. You want your real life challenges, so you want a solution to that. And how do you get that solution? I can give you a solution to anything, but the solution that I give you may not be cost effective or may not be responding to the challenge that you're facing. So if you pose a problem, and sanitation is not a rocket science problem. I mean, let me start with that. It's something very straightforward. Uh, you know, um, uh, our friend from Karnataka was talking about um, underground um, drainage and uh, sanitary system. Look, I was ambassador to the UN in Geneva, and I used to have a beautiful villa which the government had rented on the banks of the um, uh, Lac Laman or the Lake Geneva, and it was still using in as late as 2005, the pit system where there was no, uh, so every two months a truck used to come and fetch. So look, that's a, that has been the standard all over. So I keep telling people, it's very easy to change all this. But when we are dealing with technology, we are dealing with innovation. I mean, yesterday we announced uh, uh, a technology challenge um, uh, results for having to deal with uh, manual scavenging. Now, it's very simple. You're, deal you're in a highly complex traditional society. We have banned manual scavenging by law. I mean, it's, it's, it's a punishment, it's a criminal offense. But what do you do if contractors still utilize unsuspecting people who, without gear, go into those manhole um, covers, etc.? So now we are giving, coming out with a technology challenge, how you can do this other ways. The point I'm making is that while we continue to endeavor to successfully implement new solutions, which you will come out with. Uh, pilot scale, then you must spread these to the entire country. Therefore, I want to acknowledge the significance of what the National Institute of Urban Affairs is trying to do with this project, Urban Innovation Hub for Urban Wash Solutions, which has also been supported by the US government. I think the need of the R is to upscale and mainstream the innovations at city level. And I am particularly happy to see the NIUA is working on ways to enable cities to procure and mainstream the innovative solution. Jagan, I don't know what your plans are, but the results which come from this, will you put them down in a booklet or uh, uh, you put them, disseminate them? This is the only way that innovative wash solutions can have the desired transformational impact by improving the lives of our people. I'm only 14 months into the job, and um, I always like to acknowledge up front that there is more that I don't know than I do know. But I think one thing is clear, that there is a need to rework the entire urban ecosystem that exists in our country. That I also mean the ways that city governments work. And I'm therefore happy that your project is building innovation ecosystems at the local level so that the ULBs can have the support and collaboration of local technical institutions of the industry and business chambers and the local community-based organization. Now, no matter which field you look at, uh, dealing with simple things like reverse osmosis plants, you dealing with other things which should, uh, in the interest, mm -hmm. technology is available at the press of a button, you can know, but it comes with a cost. Now, what you need to do is to be able to get your local entrepreneurs access those technologies, but come up with solutions which are particularly specific and local, because that's how you build a solution, because those will be more sustainable in the long run. And I want to conclude with something I had been saying for a long time. Insofar as my ministry is concerned, you know, we have many tasks on our hand, war water, sanitation, hygiene. We also have to bring, build one Chicago every year, uh, 700 to 900 million square meters of space. Much of it is being done. But uh, the global technology, uh, the global construction technology challenge, which we had announced some time ago, is we are about to complete work on that. That will give another opportunity for technology 
um, and other economic entities around the world to come and look at the opportunities that are on offer here, also to share their experiences, and then hopefully when the two mate, to, for them to be able to participate in this exercise. Thank you very much.